nature of your emergency. Your world can change in the blink of an eye. He walked into the bedroom and you know that she had been murdered. So he's running up and down, screaming. Oh my God, someone called 911. There are two men killing a girl. I know my son and he would not go that long without saying anything to anyone. Safety can be an illusion and reality a nightmare. So how do you steal a person, a grown person? Unspeakable crimes can penetrate any small town, big family, pretty face, or innocent child. And in the wake of a loved one's murder or disappearance, there is nothing more cruel or desperate as silence. Why won't people talk about it? That's another thing. People don't want to talk about it around here. For the families of the missing and murdered, they gambled with their sanity as they lose hope in closure and settle for justice. That's where the cold case playing cards come in. In each episode of the Dealing Justice podcast, your hosts Jennifer Dubasek and Lori Jennings will spotlight one card from the cold case playing card deck. Hear the victim's story from the friends and family who knew them best. Her mom will never stop fighting until she finds out what happens to her daughter. Learn about the crime and help close the case. Welcome to season two. We're not just playing cards, we're dealing justice. Hello everyone, this is Mike. And this is Gibby. And we're the hosts of the True Crime All the Time Unsolved podcast. If you haven't already, we'd love to invite you to come check us out. Starting in January of 2017, we've amassed over 230 episodes of some of the most intriguing unsolved cases in true crime history. We cover some of the very big unsolved cases, but we also like to cover some of the lesser known cases, some that you may have never heard of. We dive into the details. We talk about the victims, their life, the circumstances around their disappearance or murder murder and we cover the potential suspects and persons of interest. We try to give you all the known facts you need to satisfy your amateur detective. We like to think that we don't take ourselves all that seriously, but we take true crime very seriously. You can listen to True Crime All the Time Unsolved now on Podcast One, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You know you want to. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on the prosecutors, we continue our look into the John Bonet Ramsey case and talk about the ransom letter. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my matchless co-host, Alice. Oh, Brett, that's really nice. And very fitting. I don't know if you've been watching it, but we've been binge-watching Ted Lasso and, you know, the match. <laughs> huh? Huh? I've never seen it. It's, uh, I think you'd really like it. I really like season one. Season two was interesting. I remember... I remember the skits from like when the Premier League first came to the United States like 10 years ago. It was on Fox. And that's what the show is based on is they did these, you oh. know, it was a, the joke at the time, these skits about football in America. We don't know what football is and he's a football coach, but not a soccer coach. Anyways, so I guess the show's pretty good. It's what everybody says. The first season is phenomenal. The second season... I have some thoughts, but maybe we'll save that for another time. There were a couple of add-in episodes, one of which almost ruined the whole season for me. It was just oh, wow. so, so worthless and baseless, and I thought mm. detracted from the entire season. Um, wow. And I found yeah, out well, after really the fact. You're really stirring up controversy today. <laughs> well, I found out after the fact. This made me feel somewhat better, was that I guess they got so popular. I don't know what the reason was, but they 
after they finished the season, they were granted two more episodes. So they like created two standalone episodes that they slotted into the season. And that's why there's no continuity. So it made me feel better that they didn't intentionally. Maybe it was just to make money. Yeah, like it sounds like a money grab to yeah, me. Yeah, but it was like – it was so, if you watch it, we'll discuss it at length because I think it was a terrible episode. Yeah. Hmm. Well, hopefully nobody's saying that about our podcast. <laughs> they might Hopefully be. nobody's like, those but John Benet Ramsey episodes. They God, they're awful. Oh, Great my God. Great podcast. I, Jesse I still, Sharp and John you know, Ramsey. We are obviously still recording, and this is like well in advance of anyone hearing it because we're trying to get ahead. Um because we have trial coming up and yeah, I'm still Christmas so nervous, still so it. nervous that people are going to hate it. Like, I don't know. Not yeah, that people really are going to hate it. I'm for some positive early reviews. But. I don't think it's that I'm nervous people are going to hate it because people hate things we do all the time. It's more that I want to do it justice and we kind of yeah, only get it. one chance yeah. to do it. There's not like a right. do-over. Right. Yeah, I feel – I feel much more – I don't know why, but I just feel much more nervous about these, these episodes than I normally do. And, and I think that is it. I, I want to do this case justice, and, and, and hopefully we are. But, you know, we can take our slings and arrows if you think this is going too long. But if, if, if somebody says we did too much, that doesn't bother me. You know, <laughs> if people say we're too thorough, that doesn't bother me. That never bothers me. I don't – I want to address all the important stuff, and that's why we're taking our time on this case. And we're going to take our time today with the ransom letter in this case. Anyone who's familiar with this case knows about the ransom note. We've talked about it in the first three episodes briefly. Essentially, the finding of the ransom note and how it kicked off everything. Well, obviously, what do we know about the ransom note? We know that it was written by someone who was involved in the crime. Presumably the person who killed John Bonet, depending on whether or not you think this was a one-person act or an accomplice, but whatever the case, whoever wrote this was intimately involved in her death, whether they were directly responsible for it or not. And it is just rare to know that you're holding in your hand a piece of evidence that if you could connect it to the source would be the person responsible. You know, you think about DNA and fingerprints and we've talked about how there's DNA and fingerprints everywhere. So just because you find DNA doesn't mean when you run it and you figure out who it is, that it's actually the killer. You might run it and realize that was the guy who, you know, changed the pipes or cleaned the house the week before. And it's a dead end, right? But with this, there's no question. Find the person who wrote this note and you'll find the person who killed John Benet Ramsey. So obviously there's been a ton of focus on it and a lot of discussion of it, and we are not going to shy away from doing the same today. You know, Alice, I don't know how much time you spent looking at it. It is one of the the strangest pieces of writing that that I've ever seen. I mean, you know, I'm not going to act like I've ever uh, I've ever handled a case with a ransom note before. I have handled cases with writings before, and cases where writings were important, and the author of writings were important, but never a ransom note. But I dare say that no one, even people who've dealt with a lot of ransom notes, have ever seen anything like this. No, I think you're right, Brett. I've had writings as well. Not a ransom note, but writings in my cases that have mattered for the case. And I've never read something that kind of hurt my brain so much to read it, right? When you read something that does not flow in kind of the normal vernacular and the way we speak, it makes it difficult to read because our brain works really quickly and it actually fills in gaps and doesn't take in every word and every letter when we read something, right? And so it, when your brain can't use those shortcuts, it makes it very jarring to read um, a letter like this. And that's how I know this letter is so odd is my brain can't rely on any of the shortcuts it normally can in kind of daily life. And we're going to post this note on the website. Obviously, you should read it if you've never read it before. We're going to read it to you today. A couple of things to note just from the very beginning. I think one of two things happened here. I think this is pretty well accepted, though. I'm sure there are people who would disagree with me. Either Patsy wrote this or an intruder wrote it. I think those one of those two things is true. We're going to talk about some of the handwriting analysis in this case, but I think one of those two things is true. I think if an intruder wrote it, I think they did it before the crime was completed. So I don't, for instance, think that whoever did this 
killed John Bonet and then wrote the note. I think they would have written it beforehand. If Patsy did it, obviously she would have written it after the murder. We can talk about why, and we'll talk about why I'm a fan of those those timings later on. But those are sort of the the assumptions I'm going into this discussion with. Obviously, you can make your own decisions. There's a lot to discuss here. Brett, before we move on, there's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care. A product that works wonders for curls might make straight hair limp and greasy. And right now, with the heat running all the time because it's cold outside, my hair gets staticky and frizzy and dry. But no longer because of my personalized pros routine. I can honestly say I've never been more in love with my hair. Pros makes custom hair care that's effective because it's personal, using natural ingredients with proven results. Pros customizes every product in your routine from shampoo to supplements. First, Pros starts by asking about you as a person with their in depth consultation. And Pros asks me really unexpected things like, my zip code and the damage level of my hair and how much I exercise because that helps them customize your hair care. Next, pros analyze all of my answers and determine what unique blend of ingredients should be in every product of my custom routine. Together, pros got all my hair goals covered. As a carbon neutral certified B corporation, pros is an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. If you're not 100% positive, Pros is the best hair care you've had. They will take the products back, no questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash prosecute. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash prosecute for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. One thing that's worth noting, as I said, handwriting experts have looked at this and they have all but definitively excluded John from being the author of the note. Patsy, it's more complicated. There are experts who stated that Patsy was all but excluded from writing the letter and there are other experts who strongly believed she was the author. We're going to talk about some of those experts later. It's one of the craziest things about this case is depending on who you hear about the case from, they will either tell you, generally because they're coming at this from a, a bias one way or the other, they'll either say the experts who looked at it absolutely thought it was Patsy, or they'll say the experts who looked at it absolutely thought it wasn't Patsy. And it seems like there were just a bunch of experts who looked at it and they kind of reached different conclusions. We'll talk about that in a second. But before we read the ransom note, there is something else that I want to do. You, if you're familiar with this case, you have heard before that the ransom note includes references to other ransom notes in movies. This seems to be true. We're going to read the ransom note. But one thing I wanted to do that I've never really heard done before, I want to read to you some excerpts from ransom notes in movies, particularly the ones that people think are referenced in the, the John Bonet Ramsey ransom note. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to start off. I'm going to read to you these ransom notes. And I want you to think as we're reading John Bonet's, if these are references to these movies, and if they are, if that explains why there's some of the weird, unusual uh, aspects to the John Bidet Ramsey note that have confused people up to this day. So let's start with Dirty Harry. Dirty Harry, great movie. If you haven't seen it, there is a serial killer in the movie who is modeled on the Zodiac killer. And at one point he kidnaps a girl and buries her and then is giving Harry clues about where she is and he needs to find her before she dies. So he's actually doing this over the phone. He's talking to he's talking to Harry on the phone at various payphones around the city. So this is what he says. I bounce you all over town to make sure you're alone. If I even think you're being followed, the girl dies. If you talk to anyone, even if it's a Pekingese pissing on a lamppost, the girl dies. No car. 
I give you some time to go from phone booth to phone booth. I ring four times. You don't answer by the fourth ring. That's the end of the game. The girl dies. You listen. I'm watching you. Not all the time, but you'll never know when or where. Now get to Forest Hills Station as fast as you can. Understand? I hope you're not stupid. Downstairs. Take the K-car. Get off at church and 20th. Hurry up or you'll blow it. You sound like you had a good rest. You'll need it. I'm going to give you a nice little run this time. You better make it because if you don't, dead girl. So that's from Dirty Harry. Now Ruthless People, which is also a movie about a kidnapping, but is more of a comedy. Listen very carefully. We have kidnapped your wife. We have no qualms about killing and will do so at the slightest provocation. Do you understand? I don't like repeating myself. Do you understand? You are to obtain a new black American tourister briefcase, model number 8104. Do you understand? In it, you will place $500,000 in unmarked, non-consequential $100 bills. Do you understand? Monday morning at 11, you will proceed with case in hand to Hope Street Plaza and wait for a phone to ring. You will receive further instructions then. Do you understand? You will be watched at all phases of execution. If anyone is with you or if action is not carried out to our complete satisfaction, it will be considered an infraction to the rules and your wife will be killed. Do you understand? If you notify the police, your wife will be killed. If you notify the media, she will be killed. If you deviate from our instructions in any way, she will be killed. Do you understand? The next one is Ransom. Ransom, which is a movie starring Mel Gibson, it was actually out at the time that John Bonet was kidnapped. It had come out a few weeks before, or it had come out some time before. I'm not exactly sure when, but it was definitely out at the time. And so here's one is said in Ransom. I have your son. I want two million in fifties and hundreds. No consecutive serial numbers. No new bills. No marked bills. The money will fit into two Samsonite hard shell suitcases. Model number 260. Do not involve the police or the FBI. If you do, I will kill him. Do not inform the media or I will kill him. No tracking devices in the money or the case or I will kill him. You have 48 hours to get the money. I will contact you. And then there's the movie Nick of Time, which aired at 7.30 p.m. the night John Benet Ramsey was kidnapped on local TV in Boulder. And it involved an unnamed political faction kidnapping a six-year-old, which if you know the, the contents of the note, um, I mean, there's the fact that she's a six-year-old, but the, the political faction aspect is also important. So that's really helpful background. Keep that in mind as we now dive into the ransom note. Now, we're not just going to read the ransom note straight. You can see that on our website. You can see it on YouTube. There's going to be pictures of it. So if you want to just read it straight, you can do that. What we're going to do is stop and give you annotations regarding where the language came from, which honestly, this itself could be a complete show. <laughs> yeah, this could be a standalone show, the annotations of the ransom note, but we're going to try to fit it into this episode for you. And we will talk about the ransom note, but we're going to go ahead and, and read the whole thing with these annotations, and then we'll come back and sort of look at it more in a line-by-line -line way. Right. So here it is annotated. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. This is probably coming from the movie Ruthless People, which is, as Brett mentioned, a 1986 comedy with Danny DeVito. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills, and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. This is likely from also ruthless people. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. Again, seemingly referencing ruthless people. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you, be, I advise you to be rested. 
That seems to be referring to Dirty Harry. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money, and hence, an earlier pickup of your daughter. And note that, like a lot of the ransom notes we just read, that last line indicates that Mr. Ramsey is being watched by whoever wrote this letter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter, which, once again, ruthless people, and also to some extent, Dirty Harry. You also be denied her remains for proper burial, which is a reference to, or seems like a reference possibly to the movie Seven. We didn't read through anything in Seven, but that movie is from 1995, which is also pretty close to the time of the kidnapping. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., results in your daughter being beheaded. If I catch you talking to a straight dog, she dies. Remember, Dirty Harry. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. Dirty Harry, ransom, very similar. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. Dirty Harry. You'll be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. Once again, Dirty Harry in Ransom. And if, As I was reading through those earlier, there are these constant references to, she dies, I will kill her. Just repeating that phrase over and over again, and you have that in this Ransom note as well. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions, and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny, as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John, which is almost an exact quote from the movie Speed. You're not the only fat cat round, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It's up to you now, John. Victory, S-B-T-C. So, there are a few things that jump out about this letter. Oh, I mean, there's a lot. Basically, every line of this letter, I feel like you could spend hours analyzing. And people, people have done that. First of all, it's made out to Mr. Ramsey. Apparently, and we're going to talk about this more as we dive into some of the physical evidence in this case... This letter was written on a notepad that came from the Ramsey household. It, in fact, was one of Patsy's notepads that she would use to write notes. The reason that the police had it in the first place is that when the police asked for some handwriting samples, John grabbed this notepad because he knew it had some of Patsy's writing in it and gave it to the police. The police then take it back to Boulder and... As the person who's flipping through this looking for some handwriting, as he's doing that, he notices a couple things. One thing he notices is that a large number of pages have been torn out of the middle of this, more than would be required to write this note, which is interesting in of itself. It will later turn out that these pages that this letter is written on, there are three of them, came from that notepad. They were able to match up the tears from the, the paper themselves and the notepad. The other interesting thing they found was an apparent early attempt at writing this note. So whoever initially wrote this appeared to write Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey as if they were going to address this to both parties, but then they changed their mind. They ditched that attempt and in the final letter only addressed it to Mr. Ramsey. How did the police know that there were multiple attempts? at writing the letter. So they found the practice note that started off Mr. and Mrs. And the they think that the other pages that are torn out, so basically where the note, the note that we know is the note was torn out, there were additional pages around it that were torn out. So the police suspect that there was the initial start, the Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey start, the person, whoever wrote this, stopped that. They then wrote some other ransom note. For whatever reason, they were unhappy with that one. They removed those pages. Those pages disappeared. We don't know where they are, but they're gone. And then wrote this note. So and generally, it seems like the police think, and Thomas in his book talks about this, um, that there were at least three notes 
the the I mean, it's hard to call the first note a note. It's just Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, but it doesn't even say Ramsey. It just says Mr. and Mrs. in the line that probably starts R. But there was that, then something else written that was removed, and then this note. Now, obviously, the note starts off listened carefully. A lot of people focus on this a lot as if this is significant because it's written and not spoken. I actually don't think this is that significant. There's a couple things. Number one, I think this comes from Ruthless People because that's what Ruthless People starts. Now, I believe that is, that's not a written ransom note, I don't think. I believe that's a telephone call. But nevertheless, I think either the person was copying it or it's just a colloquialism. They're saying, listen carefully, read carefully. They could have written that, but it's just, this is just the way they're going to start the note. Like, I don't, I don't think there's some deep significance to them saying, listen even though it's not a spoken letter. So then there's the next line. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction, which may be the strangest line ever written in the history of mankind, period, in any context. <laughs> like, there's so much going on in this. We are a group of individuals, which is weird. Not just we're a group or we are individuals, but a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. And as people have pointed out, Many times, it is a strange thing to announce to your victim that you're small. You're not, you're not a big foreign faction. You're not a powerful foreign faction. You're not an intimidating foreign faction. You're small. You're just a tiny little foreign faction. You're foreign, and you're a faction. And they represent the small foreign faction. They are not the foreign faction. Right. Exactly. It's just an interesting colloquialism to say we represent them. Like, did they vote you in? Are you part of them? Or are you, like, hired help? You represent them as attorneys. And we've talked about a lot of movies. This one, even though there's not, it doesn't fit a line specifically. If those of you who've seen Die Hard, in that movie, Hans Gruber at some point is on the phone with the FBI and he's talking about how all of their political brothers and sisters need to be released. And he says the new Provo Front and some members of, I think, Asian Dawn. And one of his henchmen is like, Asian Dawn? And he says he read about him in Time Magazine or something. <laughs> I, I often think about Hans Gruber, this weird group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. It's very much like that, where he's just saying that. Those of you who have seen the movie Die Hard, which I assume is all of you, they, the whole point was they were trying to pretend to be this political terrorist group who was there for all these high lofty reasons, when in fact, they just wanted to rob the place. That's all they wanted to do. And to me, so much of this letter reflects that like the letter is all a lie you know i've heard people go through this letter and and try and figure out are they really are they really a small foreign faction and all this other stuff and they're not i mean they're not a small foreign faction there's no there's no foreign faction there's no conspiracy there's no group out there it's just one person and the and the note is a lie and it's a lie no matter who wrote it whether it's an intruder or whether it's patsy the whole thing is a fabrication. It's all a lie. It's a cover-up, right? So whoever's doing this, and I think that's one of the things, when you think about the psychology of whoever wrote this, whoever's doing this is trying to tap into something. They're trying to sell a line to the police, to the FBI, to whoever's going to investigate this in the same way that Hans Gruber was doing that in Die Hard. They're trying to sell something. And I think that's why you see so much of this complexity here, right? It's overriding. You know, you see this a lot. People who are insecure in what they're writing. Think about a brief. Those of you who are lawyers out there, legal briefs. The most, the more complex the language, the more complex the writing, the more unnecessary words, unnecessarily complex words, long words. The more flowery it is, right? The more flowery language. The, the more exactly. Latin words you throw in that are unnecessary to make it exactly. difficult to read. That is a person who is insecure in their own abilities in, in writing, in briefing. They're insecure in their case, and they're trying to cover it up by using that. And I feel like you're seeing that here. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. If this were really a small foreign faction who wanted to admit their smallness, they would just say, we are a small foreign faction, or we have kidnapped your daughter on behalf of our small foreign faction or something. I don't know, but you wouldn't write this. And that makes sense, Brett, because the, even the first line you said goes along with what you're saying. Listen carefully. I'm I'm going to be listening carefully. This is a ransom note and it's handwritten and it's laying down and I can't find my daughter. Of course, I'm going to be listening carefully. You don't have to tell me that. This is like the attorney who stands up in court and like pounds the table, you know, before they talk or while they're talking. It's like, I, I get it. 
I get what's happening right now. You don't need to start with an exclamation point. The letter then goes on to say, we respect your business, but not the country that it serves. Interestingly, business is misspelled. It's misspelled with two S's, B-U-S-S-I-N-E-S-S. -S -S. And there's a lot of debate of whether or not this is intentional or not. As someone who can't spell very well, I'm a terrible speller. Even with words that I should know how to spell, particularly when I'm handwriting something, I'm always concerned that I'm going to misspell a word because I just forget. And I do it a lot with these kind of things. Not business so much, but, you know, traveling. Are there two L's or one L? You know, that kind of thing, right? Like, it's... I will say this about business, though. It's a, it, I can see it being a common word to misspell while you're writing because you know there are two S's in the word. And you may forget as you're writing where the two S's go. So I, as I'm looking at the actual handwritten part of it, you'll notice that right after we and before respect, there's actually a scratch out. It looks like they messed up. And so it doesn't look like whoever's writing this is shy about scratching out something that is wrong. But business is written as a full word, right? The extra S isn't extra fitted in. It has the spacings that normal letters would have. And it seems like they're they're speaking as they write. You know how when you speak, you have to slow down your speech because you write slower than you speak. And they're like business. And they put two S's because there are two S's at the end, just not in the middle. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about. Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Yeah, I don't think this is intentional. I don't think this is some like, we're trying to convince you that English is not our first language or we're not highly educated. There are things about the note that make you think that as it goes, particularly the English is not our first language thing. I just think this was an honest mistake. I just think they messed it up. What's interesting about the scratch out, which if you guys are looking at the, the letter, it almost looks like they were going to write, we don't, we don't respect your business but then change their mind and decide to say, no, nah, we respect your business. So I was like, well, you know, we got your daughter, so we're not going to knock your business. So we respect <laughs> your business, right? But not the country that it serves, which Access Graphics is a computer company. It doesn't really serve a country. It's an American company. Now, it had been bought by a larger conglomerate, which arguably is a government contractor in some ways. So maybe they're referencing that, but I don't, I don't actually think so. But the craziest thing about all this, we are totally bearing the lead here. Right. And that we've got, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals who represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. We've got three sentences in and we're finally going to tell you, oh, and by the way, we have your daughter. <laughs> right. <laughs> to me, it's very strange that we have three sentences into this and we haven't gotten to the, to the fact that at this time we have your daughter in our possession. And even this, just say we have your daughter. It's like at this time we have your daughter. In our possession. So many extra words. Unnecessary so words. Many like extra if we words. were editing this, there'd be so many words cut out, right? At this time, unnecessary. Just we have your daughter in our possession. When I look at this letter, when I look at the letter, it looks like someone who's nervous is writing this. The the way the letter is written looks shaky. It looks like a hand that is shaking to me. Like the very first we, the W in the very first we. There's so much movement going on in, in the person who is writing this letter that I do think they're nervous. And 
And I think, I think that fits into this, all of these extra words, you know, this is someone who is nervous. They're not, they're committing a very brazen crime, but I don't think they're a criminal. I don't think this is somebody who has a lot of experience with crime. I think this is one of the first crimes they've ever committed, particularly one of the most serious they've ever committed. This is not the second time they kidnapped someone or the second time they killed someone. This is the first time. I think they're nervous. And I think that shows both in the handwriting and all of the verbiage that they're using to write this. I also think the length, why is it so long? Why is the letter so long? You don't need all this. I mean, the movie letters aren't this long. Real ransom notes are not this long. I mean, ransom notes can be kind of long. It's not true that no ransom note is ever long, but this is probably the longest one. And why is it so long? Why all this extra fluff? I think that's also related to the fact that this is a person who doesn't really know what they're doing. And I don't know, Alice, when I get nervous, I talk. That's one of the things I do. I tend to talk too much. If I'm nervous, I don't like silence. <laughs> and that's why, that's why the timing of this letter is so interesting, right? Like if you have a dead girl in the basement and then you sit down to write this, that's very confusing. It would explain the nerves and the shaking. I agree with you. The, the handwriting honestly looks like someone who suffers from tremors, right? It's, it's mm. so like the W has that extra tail at the, at the end of it, because it's like you couldn't control your pen to take it off the paper before you're your hand tremored and or the person is shaking because they are nervous but this is a long time to stay nervous and sit there if there is a dead body in the basement and you know it's there now if this were written before anyone was dead and maybe they did not intend to kill john bonnet you can see that they're very amped for the crime the crime that they think is going to happen whether it be kidnapping or something worse than that but they have the time to be so nervous and pent up because the crime hasn't been committed. And so the adrenaline hasn't been released. Right. And as I was saying earlier on my theories about when this crime was committed, I think that if it were a stranger, this person was in the house waiting on the Ramses to get back from their party. I think the Ramses were at their party. This person was in the house. They had a lot of time to wait. They knew what they were going to do. And during that time, they wrote this letter. And so I think there was a lot of nervous energy. They were very nervous. They're writing this letter. Maybe they wrote it twice. In any event, there was a lot of nerves going on here. Now, if it wasn't the intruder and it was Patsy, then it happened after the murder. And you can obviously imagine why she would be nervous. Her daughter is dead. She's creating this letter that she needs to do well, or the police are going to figure out she did it and she'll lose everything. When she finishes this letter, she's going to have to call and the police and, and, and start the whole process. So she would be very nervous. And I think either way, that's what you're seeing sort of going on here. And on the handwriting thing, whether it's Patsy or someone else, I think anyone would know that the more handwriting you have, the more likely a handwriting expert is able to make sense of it. Right, because you just have so many ways to look at the letter A, for example. The letter A that's written in the letter is very distinctive. It's kind of like the typewriter A rather than how I learned to write an A, which is like a circle and a line. To write such a long letter works against your interest if you don't want to be found out in general. Now, maybe the person didn't know that, but just generally you're leaving behind more clues. And so it's counterintuitive to write a long ransom note. And Alice, you know, it's funny you mentioned the A because that is something people have pointed to about Patsy, that this is the tale, that Patsy wrote this sort of typographical A, which is more complex and more fancy. Patsy wrote a lot of notes. She wrote a lot of Christmas notes for the family, and in those notes she would often use the A. People say, and this is debated, that she used it less after this note was written because she didn't want to be connected to the note. Who knows? She could have done that, innocent or guilty. But that is a really interesting point. And that's the kind of things people look at and experts look at when they're trying to figure out who is the author of a, of a note. I will say this, though. If well, we know that this paper that the ransom note is written on came from a pad of paper that had Patsy's handwriting on it, if, in fact, an intruder had this pad of paper and was biding time, had lots of time to kill while he was waiting for the Ramses to get home— he could have looked through and tried to model handwriting after 
Patsy and may have tried to, may have not even known whose handwriting that was, but known that it was someone in the home's handwriting and picked out something to, that was distinctive, like the A. But if we see that, we typically see some slip up in the letter. And I don't think in all the A's in this three-page letter, there is a slip up in how the A is written. And it's an interesting point. I mean, this is Patsy's notepad. Arguably, that could be something they were doing, which is look at the note, look at Patsy's handwriting, and then as you're writing the note, try and make it look more like Patsy's. Maybe that's even the reason. Like We don't know. It's complete speculation about how much they wrote in the other note, if there is another note, why they got rid of the other note. It's possible that they finished, they looked at it, and they realized, you know, the handwriting is just not good enough. It's not close enough. I need to do it. I need to do it differently. I need to do it better. I know we might be jumping ahead a little bit because you've mentioned this. I want to know what you think. Do you think the handwriting looks less nervous or at least less shaky from the first lines to the last lines? Yeah, I think as it goes on, as the letter goes on, it's far less shaky, far less nervous. Not only does it look less shaky to me, but it looks like if they're using the same pen, they're pressing down with more vigor because the lines are thicker. And so you have like more confidence, right? Like now you're on a mission and you're writing harder. No, I agree. It looks faster. It looks like it's written faster, which I do the same thing. You know, I don't write a whole lot. Hand, I don't do a lot of handwriting, you know, so I don't write a lot of notes to people. But if I do, I'll often notice that it starts off neat. And then as it goes, you know, it starts to get sloppier and sloppier. And I feel like this person, it starts off nervous. And as it goes, it gets less nervous and it almost feels like it's being written more quickly. And I think an interesting thing, you mentioned the A, if you continue to read through the note, there are places where the A is not the typographical A. As, as it continues, there will be places where suddenly you're seeing... Ah, like law enforcement. Exactly, where you're seeing that other kind of A, and, and that's an interesting thing. Like, what does that mean? Why does it change? I don't know. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but just as we're looking at this, I mean, these are little interesting things to consider. Okay, let's keep reading. So they have our daughter in your possession, or our possession. She is safe and unharmed. She's both safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. Once again, this flourish here. If you want her to see 1997. And look, I say we're early in this. This is our fourth episode on this case. But you got to be thinking the whole time that we're doing this case, in the back of your mind, every piece of evidence we look at, is it an intruder or is it a family member? There are people who read this letter and really think it sounds like Patsy for various reasons. I, I wonder if it were the mother if, if they would be making these sort of rhetorical flourishes. I don't think anybody thinks that if Patsy killed John Bonet, that it was a Darley Routier level of planning, decided she was going to do it, and then killed her. I think most people think if Patsy killed her, it was in a rage, it was kind of an accident, at least, the, at least initially, and then at some point she decided, I'm going to cover this up, I'm not going to call for help, or whatever. But not like she's a cold-blooded killer. So you have to imagine if that's what she did, if this were an accident that she's decided to cover up, that despite the fact that she did not want her daughter dead, and you would think would be pretty upset about the fact that her daughter was not only dead, but murdered by her, that that would affect the way she wrote the letter. Would she be making rhetorical flourishes like, she is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997? There are so many other ways you could write this. She is safe and unharmed. Follow our instructions to the letter if you want her back or something like that, right? But this, if you want her to see 1997, I mean, that's somebody who's, who's really thought about this, right? And they're, they're going for something with this letter when they're writing it. So just something to think about. And then gets down to business at that point. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. Now that is a laughably small number. People who knew John Ramsey said that that was the amount of money he'd, you know, he'd have in his change drawer. I mean, not really, but not a lot of money for him. It seems like a lot of money to me, probably seems like a lot of money to most of you, but for a guy who's the head of a billion dollar company who has his own plane and mansion in Boulder and really has more money than he knows what to do with, $118,000 is nothing. In fact, it's essentially his bonus from that year. It's not the exact amount. People often say it's the exact amount. It's not. 
his bonus was not a was not a round number. It was like one hundred eighteen thousand dollars and change. But that's his bonus. Most of you out there who get bonuses, your bonus isn't necessarily reflective of your overall wealth. John had a lot of money. He could have paid this easily. So it's strange that whoever did this would ask for this amount of money and this amount of money specifically, which tells you this amount of money matters. That they picked this amount for a reason. And it's strange that it says from your account. Like who cares where it's from? All, if, if they just want the money, they want the money. Like they don't care if John goes and robs a bank for it. Like just give us the money. So it's a strange additional flourish to say from your account. Yeah, it's like it's like so many of these other sort of incidents in this case or in this letter where there's this just additional language that is completely unnecessary. And once again, you would think if you're writing a ransom note in and out, finish this thing up and be done with it. But that's not true if you've got time to burn. And maybe it's not true if, you know, once you finish the letter, you're going to have to call 911. So either way, whether you think it's somebody hanging out waiting for them to get back or whether it's Patsy writing the letter, you can see why maybe you would take a little bit of extra time. The amount, though, the amount's strange. Now, if you think Patsy did it, then you think this is some sort of subconscious thing that she's accidentally signaling to everyone that she did it because she knows that John's bonus is around $118,000, and that's why she puts this number down. Possible. It's also possible that whoever was in the house saw this number, saw one of the many bank statements that John had that listed his bonus, and that's the reason they used the number. Or it's possible they knew the number, and they wanted John to know they knew the number. I mean, I think this is another thing that you have to think about. John has always said that he thinks whoever did this was targeting him, that this was all about him, and this was about sending a message to him. And I think this number tells you that. If this was an intruder, this person picked this number because they wanted John to know that it was somebody he knew. It wasn't someone random. This was someone he knew and that he had screwed over in some way, and they're going to get back at him in the most serious way possible. And I know John has spent a lot of time thinking about this, or at least he says he has, that he spent a lot of time thinking about this. You know, who was this? What did he do that led to this happening and it's hard not to think that 118,000 it's telling it's telling you something it's telling you something it's not random they didn't pick that number out of the air yeah it does seem threatening to give a dig at john and maybe that's why the letter is just addressed to john and not john and patsy to really drive home the point that no this is talking to you john alice if there's one thing we know it's important it's your privacy, particularly online. We're doing tons of stuff online now. Everything from paying your bills to your mortgage, to your banking, to what you watch and what you view online. And you don't want anybody else seeing that. And that's where NordVPN comes in. I have been a user of NordVPN for a very long time. And I can tell you they are the best in the business when it comes to protecting your privacy online. Absolutely, Brett. With all we do online these days, really working without a VPN is almost a little reckless, and I'm so glad we have NordVPN. So you all can grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash the prosecutors or use the code the prosecutors to get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free. It's also risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Come join us and be completely at ease when you are doing anything online with the protection of Nord VPN. Then goes on to say $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. I think this is just because in the movies they always say how many in hundreds and how many in other things, and that's the reason they did that. Bank. Make sure that you bring an adequate sized attache to the bank. Another line people spend a lot of time on. Who says attache? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> I mean, an attache is a briefcase, right? Um, and there's right. even a little, I mean, it, it kind of blends in with the U above it, but I think they also put a little accent over the E appropriately because an attache obviously is the, what is that, French? Oh. 
I don't know. I don't know. Don't, it's, it is. It, <laughs> don't test me here. Alice. It is a she, right? You know, right? So C H E without an accent on top is a is a probably a hard k. It's like to sound fancy. And what is an right. adequate size attaché? Like you're going to use a briefcase for some of the cash, and then the rest of it you're going to put in a plastic bag. Yeah, and you wouldn't need that big an attaché case for one hundred eighteen thousand dollars. I mean, that's not going to be that much money. In the grand scheme of things. You're right. We see this amount of money, more than this amount of money, all the time in our drug deals. All the time. And it's hidden on people's bodies. Right. Right. This is just not that much money when when you're doing it in $100 bills. I mean, that's $1,000, $100 bills, right? It's $100,000. And $1,000 might sound like a lot, but it's actually not that many. So, (laughs) you know, you you could easily fill up your briefcase with this. Your Oh, excuse me. Your attache. And... People tried to figure out why, what, what the purpose of this is. This is somebody, look, to me, this just goes back to the, this is just like the foreign faction. It's the same thing, right? It is faking foreignness. Attaché is a foreign sounding word. They think it sounds fancy. They think it sounds like something a small foreign faction would say. And so that's why they picked the word. It's not, it's not because like, for instance, some people are like, well, maybe it's Patsy because Patsy ran and. In rich circles, maybe they talked about attaches. No, that's even if it's Patsy, that's not why she's doing it. She's doing it to to present this image of these these are gangsters from Switzerland who've come to kidnap my daughter, right? <laughs> like that's that's what they're doing here. That's why they use the word attache. And interestingly enough, I mean, whenever I hear attache, I think of like an ambassador. I I don't think of a right. briefcase. Obviously, in context here, it reads as a briefcase but interestingly attache is short for says oxford dictionary short for attache case oh well there you and go. it is french by the way i have my theory on who wrote this note which i'll get into later and and what what they're doing here and and this i think is just this is just another part of it so then they go on, when you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I guess they don't want the attache. They just want you to put it in a brown paper bag. Now, why you couldn't just take the brown paper bag to get the money? Who knows? And this, this is the beginning of another very strange part of this note where everything gets really complicated and really weird and almost comical. We talked about ruthless people. I mean, this is almost a comical note. If a little girl didn't end up dead, you would just laugh at this note because it's absurd. I will call you. No, I will call you. So it's been we up to this point. It's foreign faction. Now it's I. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. Okay. Between 8 and 10? You can't just give a time? I mean, you, you need a two-hour <laughs> window here <laughs> when you're going to call? And, and you're really – this is like a really important thing, when you're going to call. You it's give like a two-hour window guy. and then you say – yeah, exactly. And then it's tomorrow. Tomorrow when? Tomorrow when you wrote it? Tomorrow when you read it? Like, what is tomorrow? You know? <laughs> like, this is just, this is the whole thing is strange. Like, why would you write this? I, I mean, I don't know. And then we have the almost, the line picked up almost exactly from Dirty Harry. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. And there are people who think, well, this is a sign it's it's Patsy because it's, it's motherly. Who's worried about you? Want to make sure you're rested? No, it, they're pulling this line from Dirty Harry. This is that's where they get this line. It might have been Patsy, but it's because she saw Dirty Harry and she remembered this line and she threw it in there. It's not because you know she's motherly or cares about John or somehow tipping us all off. That and it's very strangely formal. I advise you to be rested. Not I advise you to rest. Or I'd, first of all, it's weird to say that. I advise you to rest. Like, oh, I'm not going to rest at all. My daughter's missing. Like, I assure you, rest is not coming. Right. Yeah. I mean, when are you going to rest? I guess not between eight and 10. If we monitor, and then, and then even weirder, right? Like, if we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money. And hence, and hence, an earlier pickup of your daughter. They originally wrote delivery of your daughter, but then they say pickup. So I guess they're not going to deliver her. I mean, what a strange, strange thing to write. And notice the grammatical error. It's hence a earlier pickup right. rather than an earlier pickup. 
And yeah, it's like if you are trying to show for power by saying, listen carefully, we are a group of individuals of a small foreign faction, and I instruct you, delivery is going to be exhausting, and make sure you bring this attache. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you get there early, I'm going to, uh, I, yeah, I'd like my money early. I mean, it completely yeah, undermines everything <laughs> that they tried to do in order to sound like they were in control. Yeah, it's just so strange. It's like, it's such a weird, this part is so weird on so many different levels. It's like they change their minds because the line starts, if we monitor you getting the money early, that's a weird phrase. Why doesn't it say, if we see you getting the money earlier because we are monitoring you? We might, we will call you. Not even we will call you. We might. We're thinking about it. I don't know. I'm a little scared about what I'm doing, so we might. I don't know. Like I said, we could easily spend hours on each of these lines. I mean, I read this line and I just think this is somebody who I just... I think it's someone who has no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. I mean, that's 100% right. They have no idea what they're doing. They're trying to project that they do have an idea and... I feel like this this note started out kind of structured. I think there's structure to it. I think there are things they always intended to say, but then as they were writing it, and you guys, you've probably experienced this. You know, if you have to give a speech or something and you can't read it, but you often think about the things you're going to say. And there are often things you're definitely going to say, but then as you're talking, you're kind of throwing things in. And the things you're throwing in, as you're throwing them in, you're thinking, oh, that sounds dumb. I wish I hadn't said that. I feel like this person is doing that, that they had like a few lines they were definitely going to say. And then as they were writing it, they were like, and if you get the money early, well, I might call you and we can arrange an earlier pickup. And it's just, and they're just kind of blabbing at themselves, right? It almost, it almost seems to me like a bunch of yahoos writing this letter together and like one, one doofus is writing it and someone across the table is like, oh, oh, but what if they go early? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's put something in there. It's almost like there's different voices coming out in the letter. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's true. If I thought it was possible that more than one person were involved in this, like I said, unless it's the parents, you could totally see that, you know, just sitting around throwing throwing ideas against like there's one guy writing and there's like two guys who's telling right. him what to say and they're kind of like going back and forth yeah, and they're like appeasing totally each other with fine i'll put it at the end right you know stop johnny stop stop being annoying fine if they go early i'll put it in here or it could all be right. in their heads uh, it could be multiple voices in their head saying this but it it yeah. reads as if there are different voices speaking ones with authority and then the i and then the we and then the you know do exactly as I say with the number of bills. And then, oh, by the way, there's not really a plan. And that's why I really think there are certain things they, they always knew they were going to say. And I think the things they were always going to say are the things that sound more structured and make more sense. And then there are the things they kind of just threw in there. And I think this is one of them. I think that's, that's sort of how I read it, that that's why you have these sort of thrown in things. It almost is like two different voices. It's the planned voice and then the random thoughts coming into the person's head voice that they're also adding. And they have this line, which seems like a throwaway line, seems strange and different. And then they immediately start a new paragraph and they even indent it. So, you know, it's a new paragraph. And here they're really getting into this ransom, into this dirty, hairy thing. And, I, and I'm sure they probably rehearsed this in their head over and over again, what they were going to say. And you can see that when you read it, any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. Execution. Don't do what we say and we'll kill your daughter. But much simpler way to say it. But once again, it's a very fancy, structured sentence with this execution in there to really just, we're going to execute your daughter. And it contradicts what was said earlier. I'm going to call between these times and go to the bank at this time. But you might go earlier. Like, it, it's, it contradicts itself, right? That there are not firm instructions. You can't help but deviate from the instructions, right? Because there's nothing firm about this. It's so not firm at all. But... Then he doubles down. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial, which I just want to go back to the whole, is this Patsy? Was this Patsy writing this after her daughter's dead in the basement, either because she did it or because Burke did it or because her husband did it? Pick your theory. Would she say that? Would she talk about her daughter's remains and them being denied for proper burial and her daughter being executed? I mean, would she say those things? I mean, maybe she would. And there were people who will say, well, look, 
you know, if she's writing this, she's desperate one way or the other, and she's got to make it sound real. And so, yes, she would do that. Well, you say that, but there's no, there's no rule that says you have to write it like this, right? <laughs> like, there's nothing that's like, well, if you're going to write a ransom note, you have to talk about executions. And if you don't talk about executions, everybody's going to know it's a fake ransom note. No, you have to believe that in trying to make it real, this person whose daughter is dead, possibly at her own hands, but maybe not. I mean, that's the other thing. There are scenarios people present where Patsy did not kill her daughter. She just knows her daughter is dead, and she's writing this note to either protect John or to protect Burke. That that's why she's doing that. If she's doing that, then she would be devastated while doing it. She may be doing it to save those people and, and to not have her whole life fall apart. Possible, right? But she personally would be absolutely devastated that the apple of her eye, her beloved John Benet, who was going to follow in her footsteps, is dead in the basement, right? And is she going to be coming up with these rhetorical flourishes in the midst of her immense pain as she writes this note? Or is she just going to try and get through it as quickly as possible? So you got to think about all that as you're thinking about this. And it only gets worse. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do, and then... <laughs> It originally said, do particularly like you, but then the person <laughs> used a little carrot, which is an editing notation that you do whenever you're adding words into something, and wrote not to make it do not particularly like you. So I advise you not to provoke them. I mean, just... The little carrot alone makes it so ridiculous. What What it shows me is that the whole sentence was written, and I think that... They did not mean to say that the gentleman did like John, but rather they thought they wrote do not. And when they read over the line, they said, oh, crud, I forgot the word not, and then added it in. Yeah. I mean, just what a what amateur hour. Yeah, I'm you pretty know? sure they don't like, like you because they just kidnapped your daughter. And this is another reason this person didn't bring this note with them. The other thing, why didn't they just bring the note? If they were going to do it, why didn't they bring the note? Well, they obviously wrote it there, and we know they wrote it there because the paper came from Patsy's pad, but if they were going to bring the note, they wouldn't have made all these mistakes. You know, when they did this, if it's an intruder, they knew, they always knew they were going to write the note when they got there. They always knew that. And I don't think, like some people have speculated that they may have written a note, gone to the house, gotten the pad and the pen, and then copied what they wrote from the one note into this. I do not think that happened. And I don't think it happened because of things like this, because of crossing out delivery, because of where the sentences are obviously added in that they have not thought about before, like the 8 to 10 and if, earlier we might arrange, all that stuff. I don't think that. I think they literally, if it's an intruder, they stood in that house with the pad and the pen, they had certain things they wanted to say, and they wrote this note out. And I think that you can see that just from, from this stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, I think that's right, Brett. I think all of us in our handwriting days have copied over notes before, and you don't copy over your mistakes. You have a cleaner copy that omits the mistakes you made in the first round. Exactly. 100%. So after that, they go on to say, I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., in case... You know, there's anybody who hadn't covered, et cetera, will result in your daughter being beheaded, which is another really weird thing to write. Like, why beheaded, of all things? Why are we beheading her? It's just, I mean, killed wasn't bad enough. <laughs> but they but they use this word beheaded. And it's strange that this instruction comes so far into the letter. You would think the first thing you say is, we have your daughter. Don't call the police. Like, I, I like the et cetera. Like, in case he didn't know who he's not supposed to talk to. Like, if we hadn't said police and FBI and you'd called a you know, journalist or newspaper, well, we would have been, we would have had to honor our contract with you and release her. But we put et cetera in, so that covers everything. So now you're, you know, you're covered. Now, the strange structure of this load, the fact that there's so much, the fact that, like you said, this doesn't come earlier. Like, we have all this bloviating for pages upon pages, and then we finally say, oh, and by the way, don't call the police. You would think that the threat of beheading, is, as a parent, I would think, is just so much more visceral and descriptive than just execution, that you would want to put that earlier on the, in the letter, right? And right. obviously, execution is terrifying too, but beheading is a very specific way of executing someone that would... Uh, conjure up 
horrific images as a parent. So you would think that wouldn't be buried somewhere in the letter, but rather at the top. And according to Patsy, this backfired, right? Because according to her, essentially she read, you know, the first few sentences, gotcha, we have your daughter, then flipped out, went to look for her, couldn't find her, then called the police, never really read the rest of it. We're going to listen to the 911 call probably in the next episode. She clearly doesn't know who wrote it. And at one point she's looking at the bottom for the signature because they ask her, does it have a name? And she reads the bottom, but she never reads this middle part. So yeah, if, if this were somebody who was actually trying to communicate instructions, they totally messed up because by the time she would have gotten to this, she'd already called the police, et cetera. He goes on, and this is just straight dirty Harry. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies, which is, you know, in Dirty Harry, they actually say the dog, but, you know, stray dog works. If you alert bank authorities, she dies, which Dirty Harry, Ransom, the ruthless people, I mean, all that. I mean, it's just straight from those movies. And, and Brett, like you said, these are not verbatim quotes from the movies, but they're close enough. And that would make sense because if this person is writing the letter in the home, he's probably not watching TV. He's probably not able to go search what the actual words are. It's all from memory and our memories are right. just faulty. So it makes sense that these are not verbatim quotes. Right. No, to me, it's close enough that it's obvious they are quoting these movies, but like you said, they're doing it from memory. So it's body here and there. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You'll be scanned for electronic devices. And if any are found, she dies. So, you know, we have this sort of like litany, the like she dies parts, right? Kind of reminds me of the, the Declaration of Independence. There's the part that's like the grievances against the king and it's just like one after another. And it's kind of like that. And there's the, the she dies section where if you do this, she dies. If you do that, she dies. If you do this, she dies. And I don't know, to me, once again, it's just, this seems like somebody who is, they're writing what you're supposed to write in a ransom note, right? Like this is not... This is not their actual thoughts. It's just when you write a ransom note, you're supposed to say, if you call the police, you know, I'm going to have to kill the person or whatever. In every movie you've ever seen, that's what they say. So that's what they wrote. He goes on to say, and this is another, this is another one where they're clearly trying to present themselves as some sort of like foreign, foreign terrorism group. He knows about the police. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. So if you've seen Die Hard... The terrorists are actually using what they know the police and the FBI will do in response to their actions because they need the police and the FBI to take certain actions in order for them to rob the Nakatomi Tower vault. And Hans Gruber talks about, I think at one point he's like, you know, straight out of the FBI playbook or something like that. I can't remember exactly what he says, but he's like, you ask for a miracle, I give you the FBI. Because the FBI, what they do in this circumstance, at least in the movie, is they're going to cut the power. And when they cut the power, it resets the safe and allows them to break in, right? So this, to me, seems very much from that same idea. Like, we know how law enforcement works. We're familiar with their tactics. And so we're able to see what you're doing. Then this weird percentage thing, you stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. So they, they allow for the 1% possibility that if you try to outsmart us, you'll, you'll, you'll outsmart us and you'll get your daughter back and you won't have to pay us any money, which is a weird thing to do. So I mean, bizarre you know. because as a parent, you know, you'll do any, if you think there's a chance, you'll, you'll do it. So you're telling me there's a chance with 1%. Right. I would just say, like, yeah. you are killing your daughter if you deviate. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, why are you putting the 99% in there? And then follow our instructions, and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. So it's like, see, 99% chance of her dying. Yeah, you got a 1% chance of getting her back. But over here, you got a 100% chance of getting her back. A 0% chance of dying. So you should do this thing, right? Like, and, and just once again, does a mother write this while her daughter is lying dead in the basement? Is she going to write this kind of stuff? Like it just, it, the stuff that doesn't even make sense. You know, I mean, maybe she would, but to me, all of this stuff or a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of this stuff seems so calculated and thought through. Like somebody really thought about this before they did it. They really thought about what they wanted to say before they did it. This is not, oh my God, we got to write a ransom note. Hand me a sheet of paper. 
You know, let me jot something down. Like there is so much in this that they clearly had thought through beforehand. Now maybe Patsy spent a couple hours really thinking about what she was going to write in the ransom note. It's possible. But these, these things make me really doubt the Patsy wrote the letter story. I mean, just these strange additions do not fit to me, at least with what a grieving mother, whether she is responsible for the death or not would write. And then this last part, this last part to me, I said earlier that I thought the $118,000 is a message. It's a, it's a subtle message to John. I know you, I know more about you than you think. I'm not a stranger. I'm not random. You're responsible for this. And I want you to know that. So I'm gonna put this $118,000 thing in there. Then in this part, I think it's like almost their hatred for John bubbles over and their hostility to him, hostility to him shows through in a real way at the end of this note. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities, which is just a weird line, poorly written. Don't try to grow a brain, John, which is, once again, almost a direct quote from Speed. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. It's like insulting him, right? Oh, you think you're so rich. You think you're so powerful. You're not the only fat cat around here. You know, big deal. And now, you know, we start off Mr. Ramsey, right? We're not Mr. Ramsey in anymore. You know, we're not respecting your business, but not the country it serves. Now we're talking about John, right? Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good Southern common sense of yours, right? You think you're so smart. Well, now's the time to use your smarts. It is up to you now, John, right? I mean, just this. this now this it's getting personal, personal, right? Before right. it was so detached. It was using the words attache and we are a foreign faction. It was almost written with a... Um, arm's length so you can't get too close to see whether I am powerful or not. And then now it's like they've grabbed John really close right up to their faces and they're spitting on him and it's now very intimate. Right. No, I think 100%. Like it's like as they're getting to the end of the note and they know the end is coming up, it's like they can't help themselves. They haven't they it, it, earlier they thought about saying that they did not respect his business, but they changed that and said, we do respect your business, right? Like at the beginning, it's very shaky. And they're calling it Mr. Ramsey and all this other stuff. By the end, they've dropped that. Like you said, they're getting more confident as this note goes on. The handwriting is stronger. The they're, It's not as shaky. They're pressing down with more force. They're making darker strokes with the pen. They're writing faster and their emotions are starting to come out. This whole like John thing, right? That they're showing here. And look, I think this person, they're, they're clearly unstable. There's some instability here in this person's mind. I think that's the reason the note is kind of all over the place. We talked about Britney Spears and her statement that she made in her, one of her um, hearings about whether or not the conservatorship should continue that was over her. And we talked about how there were parts of it that were really strong and really powerful, but then it would kind of wander off and, and she would ramble some. And then there'd be parts where you just really didn't understand. And when you looked at the whole thing together, it just seems like there were some issues there that she was still working through, right? When I read this note, there are parts of this note that seem well put together. Somebody really thought about this. This is exactly how they wanted to say it. They spent a lot of time thinking about it, but then there's this instability in it where they are just throwing in lines that they hadn't thought about and their emotions are coming through and they're no longer structured and they're showing more of themselves than they intended to show when they started. That's what I'm seeing in the note. Yes. I think at the beginning they were trying to create an image of who they wanted to be or who they wanted to be perceived as, but they can't help themselves like you said. And at the end, this is actually more their voice coming through. And then it concludes victory, exclamation point, and then some initials, S-B-T-C, which people spend a lot of time trying to figure out what those letters mean. They've never succeeded in doing so. I'm sure these letters have some significance to the writer. I don't know that you'll ever figure it out. It's like in the movies, how people always figure out people's passwords. 
they're always like, they think, you know, they're at the computer and they think for a second and they're like, ha ha, and they write it out, right? And in reality, it's actually really hard to guess somebody's password because they'll often be all over the place and, you know, who knows what letters and numbers they're using or anything. I think this means something to this person, but no matter how long you try, how long you spend trying to figure out what SBTC stands for, I don't think you'll ever figure it out unless we catch the person. And I would love to know what it means, but... I just don't think it's not going to be easy. It's not going to stand out to you. Right. And it's probably some phrase that means something to this person because I know I know that there are periods after each of the first three letters, but not the last one. So it's like, I don't know. They're like saying it out loud, whatever the phrase is in their head or something, and they're leaving out the, the, the things in between. And it's possible that it's also something they thought John might recognize how much there's there's some deep psychology at work in this letter i think it's possible whoever wrote this really wanted john to know who it was and thomas his theory is actually that john did not know that john bonnet had been murdered that patsy had murdered john bonnet in a fit of rage covered it up written the note then woke john up and, and acted like she just discovered this note. And that when John read the note, he realized it was Patsy who wrote it. That's his theory. He realized it was Patsy, and then he had to make a decision. Is he going to destroy his entire family, or is he going to protect Patsy? And he decided to protect Patsy. I think that's an absurd theory, by the way. I don't think there's any way that's the way it went. If Patsy did it, I think the first person she told was John. But that's his theory, and, and nonetheless, that, that he read this letter, realized that, you know, his wife had killed his daughter and decided to protect her. Possible? Possible. <laughs> but I, but I that's don't, really I don't risky to leave it to the letter. Oh, yeah. I'd be like, dude, so, this is what just happened. You're going to need to cover for me. I'm not going to yeah. leave it up to some random note. Exactly. Exactly. 100%. But, you know, under that theory, then maybe all of these things are things that are things that consciously or not were intended to alert John to that fact. We spent a lot of time on this note. I do want to talk about whether or not Patsy wrote the note and what the actual sort of opinions of experts were on this. So did Patsy write this note? Well, here are the conclusions of the only six experts to examine the note itself rather than copies of the note. So we are all looking at copies of the note, not the actual primary evidence. And... Chet Ubowski, who's with the, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, he's a police expert. He concluded the evidence fell short of what was needed to support a conclusion that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the note. Ubowski also publicly denied on April 10, 2000, the accuracy of the Boulder Police Department statement that he concluded Patsy Ramsey wrote the ransom note. He also denied the claim, repeated by both Thomas and Kohler, that 24 of the alphabet's 26 letters looked as if they had been written by Patsy. So in other words, the police expert for Colorado Bureau of Investigation concludes that it's inconclusive. You cannot say it is Patsy. Richard Dusak, who's with the U.S. Secret Service, he's a document examiner, also an expert, concluded that he found a lack of indications and noted that a study in comparison of the questioned and specimen writings submitted has resulted in the conclusion that there is no evidence to indicate that Patsy Ramsey executed any of the questioned material appearing on the ransom note. So Dusak reaches a stronger conclusion, which is that there is no evidence that Patsy wrote the letter. Lloyd Cunningham is a forensic document examiner, and he was hired by the defendants to examine the note. He concluded, quote, there were no significant individual characteristics, but much significant difference in Patsy's writing and the ransom note. So he goes even further. Not only is there no evidence that this is Patsy's writing, it's actually very different than Patsy's writing. Howard Ryle is a forensic document examiner certified by the American Board of Forensic Document Examiners, and he was also hired by the defense. He concluded his opinion was between, quote, probably not and elimination 
of Patsy Ramsey as author of The Ransom Note, further stating that he believes that the writer could be identified if historical writing was found. Again, a negative as to whether Patsy is the author. Leonard Speckin is a forensic document examiner, and he's the police's expert. He concluded, quote, I can find no evidence that Patsy Ramsey disguised her handprinting exemplars. When I compare the handwriting habits of Patsy Ramsey with those presented in the questioned ransom note, there exists agreement to the extent that some of her individual letter formations and letter combinations do appear in the ransom note. When this agreement is weighed against the number type and consistency of the differences present, I am unable to identify Patsy Ramsey as the author of the question ransom note with any degree of certainty. I am, however, unable to eliminate her as the author. So note that conclusion is actually very similar to one we heard previously, which is that there are a large number of differences. These examiners are not looking just at the similarities, but also at the differences. And the last examiner, the last expert to look at this document was Edwin Alford Jr. And he's a private document examiner who was also hired as a police expert. He concluded, examination of the questioned handwriting in comparison with the handwriting specimen submitted, quote, has failed to provide a basis for identifying Patricia Ramsey as the writer of the letter. So we just read to you the conclusions of the only six experts to examine the actual note, and all of them could not conclusively say Patsy was the author and more so leaned towards the fact that she, some could eliminate her as the writer. And you obviously, you can find experts who will say that they think Patsy wrote the letter, but when you find those people, they're looking at copies, not the original, which is important. Ask any document examiner about that. Very important that they be able to see the original because they can notice, particularly under a microscope, little things, little changes and pressures and where pressure is applied and not applied. I mean, there's so many things about your writing that are distinctive and they can look at those. These are the people who've looked at the original. The sort of independent police people are less strong. I mean, they basically say not a lot of evidence. It was Patsy, but can't conclusively eliminate her. The defense experts are obviously a little stronger and basically say, not only is there no evidence it's her, there's evidence it isn't her. But in any event, what you don't see is anything conclusive about her, about it being her. And this is why this is important to me. We're not talking about two or three lines here. This thing is three pages long. It goes on and on and on. There's so much evidence in this note about who did this and who wrote this. And you would just think that if you could determine it was Patsy, somebody would have determined it by now. One of these people would have said, I don't know, man, looks pretty close to me, you know, <laughs> but you don't see that. And to me, I think that's striking. And I think it's, I think it's really interesting. I, and I just believe that this note is the most important piece of evidence. You know, as we go on, we're going to talk about a lot more evidence in this case. We spent a long time on this note. I do want to say one more thing about it before we close up. We've talked about these movie quotes, lots of movie quotes. Now, there's no indication the Ramses had seen any of these movies. They would deny that they had seen these movies. Now, that's probably what they would say if they were guilty. So maybe that's not as important to you as, as it could be. But here's the problem I have with it. Whoever wrote this note hadn't just seen these movies. They had seen these movies over and over and over again. They had seen these movies enough times that they were able to essentially quote them. Not perfectly, but really close. This seems like somebody who was obsessed with this. And, and the reason I say that, this is 1996. I was able to pull those quotes. That wasn't easy. Even now, it's hard to find really good transcripts of movies, really good scripts for movies. But I was able to find them and pull them off the internet so I could read them to you. This person wouldn't have been able to do that. They also wouldn't have been able to stream these movies. If they saw them, they saw them in the theater or they picked them up at Blockbuster and watched them on videotape in their basement over and over and over again until these lines were sort of burned into their brain. That's the kind of person who wrote this. And I just wonder, is that Patsy Ramsey? Is Patsy Ramsey the kind of person who saw Dirty Harry, Ransom, and Ruthless People enough times that she would have been able to essentially quote 
those movies in the ransom letter. And once you think about that and ask yourself that, whether or not she would have been able to do that, because I think that's a really important question. And I think it goes to whether or not she could have written this letter. Really interested to hear what you guys think about this. Shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Hit us up on Twitter at prosecutorspod. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment below. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. If you're listening on Patreon, thank you so much for being patrons. Glad you guys are getting ad-free episodes. I hope you're enjoying them. As always, let us know what cases you want to hear next. And I am sure that by now there is a robust discussion going on on Facebook, in the gallery, our Facebook page, fan page. So please join it and join the discussion. Well, Alice, do you have anything else to say before we sign off for today? A lot more to say, but we've already like gone way over the a lot of time we had for this letter. So guys, come back and also tell us what you think. Yeah, we want to hear what you think. Alice and I were talking about before. We're like, this might be a short episode because we're just going to talk about the letter. And then here we are an hour and a half later or whatever. <laughs> but that's this case. Next time, we're going to go through a lot of the evidence, the physical evidence in this case, talk about the crime scene, talk about what was found, and get closer to our conclusions about what happened in this case. We will be back with you guys next week. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutor. Yeah, I got this new Oculus thing for Christmas, and I'm just really out of shape. Okay, wait, real quick. Like, What's an Oculus? It's the virtual reality headset. To do what? You know, play games and stuff. So I've, I've, I've been doing boxing, which is exhausting. <laughs> boxing is completely exhausting. So you just like, it's like exercise. Well, yeah, it turns out it is. It's a lot more exercise than a normal video game console. <laughs> That's good, right? So I've got... Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, it's great that you're getting exercise, but it's exhausting, and I'm really out of shape. Me too. Like, I, had really to, shape. I had to I had rest today. Uh-huh. It was a tough two years. I ate my feelings. I am not going to lie. I I felt fine eating my feelings. I like eating my feelings, but sometimes there are consequences. (laughs) Yeah, I've read something online and it was like, nothing tastes as good as being thin feels. And I was like, no, that's true. Maybe when I was like 18, but I I would tell my 18 year old (laughs) self it's not worth it.